action and an action component to this yeah, hour. Yeah, hang um, on to we haven't let okay. people in yet. <clears throat> What's that? We haven't let people in yet, so don't don't give your your full introduction yet. Yeah. Start. <laughs> Take two. <clears throat> Hold on. Let's. Uh, yep. Now, Tom, I think you could welcome people. Okay. Good evening and welcome, everyone. Um, we have an unusual panel tonight because we have a panel discussion and an action component during this hour. Um, and I just wanted to do the logistics of that for you first, because uh, that's an important part of what we want to do tonight. Uh, by going to the chat at any time during this hour or after the event when we will stay on, enter your address and it will give you the link to contact your senator or congressional rep to endorse the JCPOA. Um, I'm Tom Hoof, I represent Massachusetts uh, Peace Action. We also wanna thank our co-sponsors, uh, the Peace Corps Iran Association and the National um, Iranian um, Association as well. Uh, we're focusing tonight on the current status of the JCPOA and the current, which is as some might not realize uh, is, is the, the acronym for the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action. And we're going to discuss how to close the deal or whether we can close the deal um, as part of the uh, discussion. Um, most of you know that the agreement was ratified in February 2015. Um, and it was the agreement which Trump unilaterally withdrew from uh, in 2018. Returning to the deal still is not assured. It's been on again, off again effort since April, 2021, when negotiations uh, recommenced in Vienna between the Europeans and the Iranians at one table and the US negotiators in a separate room in the same hotel. Um, uh, we've gotten to the point where uh, as of August 8th, there was a reported agreement on the text and the provisions in, in that agreement. Um, so we believe, but we have not seen, and the text has not been made public, um, that we are at the point where it's possible to move forward, but no movement has been reported as of yet. Uh, we're very fortunate tonight to have as our panelists two experts who are among the best informed on the JCPOA and are actively connected with decision makers in Washington, Tehran, and Europe. Uh, Barbara Slavin. Uh, is the director of the Atlantic Council's Future of Iran Initiative and a lecturer at, in international affairs at the George Washington University. She's a regular commentator on U.S. foreign policy and on Iran, on NPR, PBS, and C-SPAN. She's had a long distinguished career as a journalist. Um, Ali Vaez is the International Crisis Group's Iran Project Director and Senior Advisor to the President. He has led the crisis groups efforts in helping to bridge the gaps between Iran and the P5 through one plus one group uh, that led the landmark 20, led to, I should say, the landmark 2015 nuclear deal. He previously had served as senior political affairs officer at the UN Department of Political and Peacebuilding Affairs. And he was the Iran project director at the Federation for American Scientists. So I'd like to start, um, kick off with uh, 10 to 15 minute introductions uh, on the current situation by Ali and Barbara and uh, address you know what what you see the current situation to be given that after six months of negotiations and still a not public uh, agreement on the on the language of the presumed agreed deal um, where we think we should start uh, I'd like to start with Ali because he's going to be um, leaving the video component of this um, at 7.30 and uh, Barbara will follow Ali. So Ali, take it away. Thank you very much, Tom. It's uh, great to be with you uh, tonight. Um, so as you said, we've been in this process of uh, negotiations to restore the JCPOA for the past 18 months. Uh, I remind everyone on this call that it took 18 months to negotiate the original agreement uh, between November of 2013, when the uh, interim agreement was reached in Geneva, uh, until the JCPOA was uh, concluded in July of 2015, uh, was also 18 months. 
Uh, and here we're not negotiating a new agreement, we're negotiating a pathway to uh, an already existing agreement. And since March, there has been a 25 page detailed agreement that describes uh, in great technical detail how the US is going to remove sanctions and come back into compliance with, uh, with its obligations under the deal, uh, and how Iran is going to roll back its nuclear advances uh, and come back into compliance as well. Uh, and there's also the sequence of events in, in great detail that all has been negotiated and has been ready for signature. Now, since March, uh, several things happened. Of course, uh, there were some outstanding issues. Uh, in March, uh, there was the question of the Revolutionary Guard's uh, designation as a foreign terrorist organization by the Trump administration uh, that Iranians uh, wanted removed. The U.S. was willing to remove that designation, but obviously in return for uh, a commitment by Iran not to target Iranian and uh, not to target Americans, uh, former American officials, uh, especially those that were involved in the Trump administration in uh, killing General Soleimani in Iraq in 2020. Um, and since then, obviously, we've seen plots of uh, um, such Iranian attacks against uh, John Bolton and some other uh, U.S. officials, and it's ongoing. But Iran was uh, reluctant to accept that commitment, and so they couldn't find a solution over uh, the FTO designation. Finally, they decided to move beyond it. But then some other uh, disagreements um, reemerged, and uh, and since then, uh, in the back and forth, they haven't really been able to find a mutually acceptable formula. Uh, one of those issues is the question of uh, uh, economic guarantees that Iran has been asking for. Of course, based on the experience with the Trump administration uh, and the fact that it snapped back uh, sanctions on Iran when Iran was in full compliance with the agreement, and this has cost the Iranian economy uh, an astronomical uh, uh, damage, uh, which is estimated by Iranians themselves to be somewhere in the range of $250 billion to a trillion. Um, so Iranians obviously don't want to have a redux of that experience and have asked for commitments that the next U.S. president uh, would either not withdraw from the agreement over, or if it does, that there would be a mechanism for protecting uh, international firms' investments uh, in Iran. Unfortunately, uh, I mean, I say this as, as a major shortcoming of our political system. Uh, there is no way uh, that any U.S. president can tie the hands of his successor. Uh, even treaties, uh, presidents can get out of them with a stroke of a pen. Um, and uh, unfortunately, this is something I think Iranians have a hard time believing uh, that uh, in a democracy, uh, the, the, the commitment of, this, of one administration is as good as uh, the lifespan of that administration, but unfortunately, this is uh, this is a problem we have, and I think it would affect U.S.'s credibility as a negotiating partner in other cases as well, like negotiating with North Korea or any other uh, country for that effect. Um, um, the second problem, uh, which remains outstanding, uh, is Iran's problems with the IAEA. Um, in 2018, the IAEA was able to find traces of nuclear material in three sites that were undeclared to the agency. Uh, the investigation started with intelligence that was provided to the IAEA by Israel. In fact, Israel in early 2018, uh, Mossad uh, successfully uh, took out some of Iran's own nuclear uh, secret nuclear documents. Uh, and used that material to uh, um, basically push the IAEA to start this investigation. But the IAEA was able to find traces of nuclear material uh, in sites that were uh, clearly sanitized uh, by Iran. Now, these are mostly related to uh, activities pre-2003 when Iran indeed had a nuclear weapons program. Um, Iran is now reluctant to, uh, and has been for the past uh, three, four years, uh, to shed light on uh, where this material came from and what it is right now. Now, I want to make sure uh, everybody understands on this call that with or without the JCPOA, based on Iran's commitments under the Non-Proliferation Treaty, uh, Iran would have to respond uh, to IAEA's questions. IAEA was created 
in order to conduct nuclear accountancy. So there is no way for the agency that could look the other way uh, when there are traces of nuclear material. Iran's concern, however, is that um, you know, there are 20 other potential investigations like this based on uh, the material that Israel took out of Iran. And if they resolve this one, uh, then there will be another uh, probe and then another one. Uh, and basically it will be constant harassment. It will be a bottomless pit uh, and Iran would never be able to reap the economic dividends uh, of the agreement because its program will be con constantly scrutinized. Uh, now, uh, the, 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 the world powers have uh, so committed to Iran, and this is already in the text of the Vienna Agreement, that they will close the invest this investigation uh, if Iran cooperates with the agency. Uh, but they cannot promise that they, there would never be a probe again in the future if indeed IAEA is able to find uh, traces of nuclear material. So this is a, another issue that remains outstanding. And as of now, in the, in the, in the latest back and forth, uh, Iran is showing uh, very little flexibility on these two demands. Uh, and now, since we're so close to the midterm elections, I don't think there is a possibility for the Biden administration uh, to show any flexibility either. Uh, everybody will be in New York. All the negotiators will be in New York next week on the sidelines of the UN General Assembly. So there might be some discussions, but I don't expect to see a breakthrough before uh, November 8th when the elections are over. At that point, um, there is a narrow pathway to a deal, uh, but there is also a real possibility that uh, the parties will not be able to bridge the remaining gaps. Um, and that's when I think uh, there is serious reason for concern because status quo is not really sustainable. Uh, the US has sanctioned almost anything that moves in Iran. Uh, you know, One of the side effects of maximum pressure strategy of the Trump administration is that it has maxed the US out of leverage. And so at this point, uh, the US has limited headspace uh, for inflicting additional economic pain on Iran unless the Europeans join the sanctions regime and unless they, the Europeans, snap back the UN sanctions, which Iran would respond to uh, in, a, uh, in a way that would be very damaging. Iran is likely to withdraw from the non-proliferation treaty altogether uh, as in, in, in reaction to uh, snapback of the UN sanctions. And of course, we know the last country that did that was North Korea in 2003, and we all know how that story ended. Um, on the Iranian side too, they have uh, escalated their nuclear program, uh, installed advanced centrifuges almost every other week, and uh, they're accumulating more and more uh, highly enriched uranium. And so now they're at the stage that the amount of time that it would take for them uh, to enrich enough uh, fissile material for a nuclear weapon uh, is a matter of days. Um, in my own calculations, it is four days. Um, this is a time frame that the JCPOA extended to more than 12 months. Um, so, you know, we're now at a stage that six months from now, uh, the Israelis, I think, will be very uncomfortable with Iran's nuclear advancements. And if Iran also wants to escalate in a way that it gets the other side's attention, uh, it, it, might, it will have to do things like enriching to 90%, which is weapons grade. Uh, or further reducing IEA's access. And all of these things are likely to be uh, perceived by the US and Israel as highly provocative. So we are at a stage that because of the limited headspace on both sides, uh, there is plenty of space for miscalculation and the kind of escalation that could spiral out of control. Uh, and that's why I'm hoping that even if they can't reach an inter uh, 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 the, the restoration uh, of the JCPOA, at least they reach some sort of an interim agreement uh, or uh, at least a single measure agreement uh, or even just an understanding on not crossing each other's red lines uh, in order to keep a lid on the current spiral of escalation uh, and buy more time until they can find a more durable uh, diplomatic settlement. Let me leave it at that and uh, turn it to Barbara. Thanks. Um, am I uh, still muted? No, I'm unmuted, I hope. Yes? Unmute. OK. Hear you. Thank you. Ali has done a terrific job, of course, in, in terms of outlining the, the, the larger picture. So let me just fill in a few details here and there. 
I think, you know, one of the most unfortunate situations in the sad saga of U.S.-Iran relations is that these two countries are very often out of sync. And the only time we've seen any real progress has been uh, in the second term of the Clinton administration, first term of Mohammed Hatemi's administration in the 90s, uh, early 2000s, and then again under uh, Obama, his second term, uh, Hassan Rouhani's first term. We are once again out of sync. Unfortunately, we were not able to revive the JCPOA while Hassan Rouhani was still in office. Iran had elections a little more than a year ago, and it has now in all of the positions of responsibility, uh, very hardline characters, many of whom uh, virulently opposed the JCPOA when it was first negotiated. So this has added a new level of complexity uh, to this whole situation. This bunch has to show somehow that they can get a better deal than their predecessors. And in fact, they really can't. I mean, the JCPOA is already there. It's 150 odd pages that was negotiated long ago. And the basic bargain is the same. Iran gets relief of nuclear related sanctions in return for rolling back its program to very strict limits and restoring a very, very thorough verification and monitoring by the IAEA. You can't really squeeze much more out of this, even though they have tried at various times to get more out of it. So it's it's been difficult. You also have a cast of characters who don't speak English, not educated in the West, have no affinity for the West. So we are far from the Javad Zarif, Abbas Aragchi days when, you know, uh, Majid Ravanchi, when, when the three major interlocutors, Ali Salehi also, major, four major interlocutors were all U.S. educated and, and fluent in English. And this makes it very hard as well. Plus, of course, the Iranians won't sit in the same room with the Americans because we quit the deal. So everything is done through intermediaries, which makes it much more cumbersome. So it's not a good situation to be in. We should add that there are also rumors that the Supreme Leader of Iran is, is either dead or quite ill. We will see if those pan out, but that led, lead, uh, leaves another level of uncertainty on top of all of this and Iran's willingness to, to come back into this agreement at a time when they are very worried that it would be of short duration and that if a Republican is elected in 2024, the whole thing would go away again. Uh, Ali and, and the crisis group have, have put out an excellent report, which I recommend to everyone, which talks about some of the fallback positions that might be possible. And we had an event at the Atlantic Council today uh, where several of the speakers also talked about very limited measures that might just prevent this from escalating beyond, uh, beyond control. I mean, right now, Iran has something like uh, more than 55 kilograms of uranium enriched to 60% purity, which is enough for a weapon. As Ali said, in about four days, you can turn that into enough weapons grade uranium for a nuclear weapon. That's very scary. So we talked about some of the things that might happen. Um, even more than the enrichment, the, the major concern is the lack of monitoring. Uh, back in, in June, the IAEA Board of Governors passed a resolution condemning Iran for its lack of cooperation over this uh, matter of the uh, traces of uranium in undeclared sites. And Iran uh, responded uh, by shutting off 27 cameras that were monitoring its nuclear facilities. So one suggestion is that Iran might switch on those cameras again, might improve the monitoring situation so that we're not flying blind about their program, in return for which the U.S. could agree to unfreeze some of Iran's assets in, say, South Korea, where they have $7 billion that's frozen in bank accounts. Or Iran could be given limited waivers to sell oil to Europe, which, of course, desperately needs it because of the sanctions against Russia and the Ukraine war. Um, and it may be that we will have to fall back on a one for one kind of uh, measure to to put a cap on this uh, for the time being if we can't get back into the deal. Now, one of our speakers at the event today, Nasser Hadian, who's a longtime observer of and participant in U.S.-Iran uh, engagement of various sorts, suggested that he thought 
that the Raisi administration actually wants this deal. So maybe there is still a way um, to get to it. Uh, Iran's economy is in very bad condition. Inflation is at 60 percent. You know, we complain about 8 percent here in the U.S., uh, Iran has managed to achieve some economic growth this year, but it, it really cannot move forward without getting access to its frozen money and without being able to ramp up particularly its oil, uh, oil sales, which it could do very rapidly. It has something like a, a hundred million barrels of oil just sitting on tankers waiting to be sold. But to do that, they have to agree to get back into the deal. So I haven't given up hope. I think it's still possible. Um, one other thing that's going to be tricky, you know, Ricey is supposed to come to the UN next week. And I think he will face more uh, opposition, more demonstrations than any Iranian president we've seen, even more than Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, who, of course, denied the Holocaust and, and was extremely controversial. Raisi was involved in the 1980s in, in a true human rights atrocity. He was one of the prosecutors who signed off on the summary, execu summary execution of 5,000 political prisoners. And Iran, in the last uh, few months under Raisi, has gone through uh, an incredible crackdown on dissent of all sorts. There gruesome pictures just on the internet today of a young woman who was beaten for uh, wearing so-called improper hijab. This guy is, he, he's a pariah. Uh, he's a, he's a, someone who is truly a, a, someone who's committed crimes against humanity. So he's going to face an awful reception in New York. And I don't know how he's going to react to that. I think it's going to make it even more difficult uh, for various interlocutors to try to talk to him, to try to convince the Iranians to accept the deal because they are going to get their backs up and say, well, you know, look at how we're treated in the West. And this will be Raisi's first visit to a Western country, as far as I know. I think also for his chief nuclear negotiator, Ali can correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, these are not people who have experience of the uh, First Amendment rights of uh, of the United States and and what goes on around uh, around the UN General Assembly, so I'm stealing myself for uh, for what this is going to to be like, and I just hope it doesn't set us back even further. Um, maybe I'll stop there, and we'll we'll take your questions. Tom, are, do we still? Tom, are you still there? <laughs> See Tom in the in the Zoom, but maybe he's muted. Yeah. Unmute yourself, Tom. All right, well, I'm not sure if we have Tom, but maybe he'll join us in a second. In the meantime, uh, we have a question from Wade Wellington. Wade, are you able to unmute? There we go. Can you hear me now? Yep. Yes. Okay, thank you. I appreciate you all. I, I, I really like the class of people that you hear, have here speaking on the, on, on the IRAM, JCPOA. But what I would like to add also too to the... Um, the IAEA, from their reports, they're saying that they would need 90% purity. It's not 60. So that's a far cry from 60 to 30 for the purity. Now, as far as the SEO and Biden's concern, that's something they that should have rectified uh, early when he first came into office. But now that the, uh, S the SEO was coming, into play, which should be signed off tomorrow. I think at this point, uh, Iran is not really concerned with uh, the United States because if they're not going to allow them into the banking system, which is that's the whole that's the whole crooks of the whole deal, because it doesn't make any sense for them to get back into the JCPOA without being able to be allowed internationally on the board under restrictive. So this is what's being held up. All the other stuff is is really a, if there's no way to 
re- recoup their funds that they're that they're missing. Yeah. So so we they have that and the cameras will shut off because of not being able to be fulfilled for as being able to get into the banking system, which which was promised. And United States said they were going to do it over a period of time of two years, but they're saying that they not want they don't want to do that. As soon as they sign the JCPOA, they want to have the following day to have access to the system. So I'll sit back and yeah. let you all speak. Let, let, let me start. Ali can fill it out. No, I mean the the reason they shut off the cameras because they were mad at the IE Board of Governors for passing that resolution. Their banking problems are longstanding. The main purpose of the the sanctions relief is that it it removes what are known as secondary sanctions, so other countries can trade with Iran freely. Europeans can buy oil, uh, South Koreans, Japanese, Southeast Asians can deal with Iran. Iran's neighbors will be in a position to do more business with Iran. The US has what are known as primary sanctions, which unfortunately are likely to remain for a long time. And I don't ex- anticipate uh, any US-Iran economic relations of, of any magnitude, maybe some food and, and, and medicine, but the, the primary benefits to Iran come from a resumption of trade with other Western democracies, uh, particularly in Europe and also in Asia. I don't know if you want to add anything to that, Ali. Sure. So uh, on enrichment, uh, Iran uh, is enriching now uh, at way above what the JCPOA allowed, which was under 5%. In fact, it was only at 3.67%, uh, with which we can't build an improved weapon. Uh, it started enriching to 20% when Israel assassinated uh, one of its top nuclear scientists uh, in November of 2020. Uh, and then uh, it uh, uh, elevated that to 60% when uh, Israel sabotaged uh, one of Iran's uh, key uh, enrichment facilities in Natanz. Um, now, the problem with 60% enrichment is, is that it's 99% of the way to 90%. So, you know, if you're enriching to 90%, uh, to 60%, you're already just a stone throws away from weapons grade. And plus, you can even use 60% uh, in a crude uh, nuclear bomb. Uh, it is basically considered a uh, highly enriched uranium that could be weaponized. So it is a very, uh, is a major concern. I mean, you. I think most of you remember when Bibi Netanyahu at the UN uh, exactly 10 years ago held up a cartoon bomb and drew a red line. Uh, that red line was on enough enriched uranium uh, to 20% for one nuclear weapon. Uh, Iran didn't have that much uranium at the time. And in fact, it never crossed it until JCPOA was reached. Uh, and at that time, uh, it would take around four months to enrich enough uranium for one nuclear weapon. Now it takes it four days, and it has two weapons worth of material at 60% and two weapons worth of material at 20% and two more at 5%. So it has an arsenal. Uh, and that's why it's so necessary to restore the JCPOA, because we don't have any better way and alternative to roll back Iran's uh, nuclear program. I think uh, that's my point. muting has been uh, unmuted finally. I was I was stuck in mute for about 10 minutes. Um, I'm not sure where that went. Um, uh, about. Along, along the lines of what we're talking about, um, I know in the afternoon conversation, there was some talk about what can one do? And maybe this is a question to both of you. Um, uh, since we are really set on not uh, doing anything until after the uh, midterm elections, uh, what are the risks and what can be done to minimize the, the fears that with this continuing uh, enrichment program that things could really spiral out of control? Um, there was some discussion this afternoon about slowing down. Is there a possibility of focusing on slowing down the, uh, the, the current Iranian activity? Yeah, I think, I think there is. You know, we'd have to promise something in return. <laughs> Uh, like unfreezing some of their assets or providing some oil waivers. I don't think the administration is in that place yet, uh, but it, it is a possibility, I suppose. Uh, I don't know, uh, you know, if if Iran would, would put that forward. Uh, one of our speakers suggested that perhaps intermediaries from from Qatar or Oman could put it, could put a proposal like that on the table. 
uh, to the uh, to the Iranians and that they might might accept that. I don't think escalation is in their interests ultimately either. Um, but it would, you know, hopefully get us through our our midterms. What do you think, Ali? Look, there are several options. Um, obviously, both sides want more. Um, you know, we want a longer and stronger agreement. That was what uh, the Biden administration promised when it came to office, not just to restore the deal, but be build a better one on top of it. Iranians also want more sanctions relief. They want uh, relief from primary sanctions as well, because they want to be able to access the U.S. financial system because without access to the dollar, you can't really have a normalized banking system. And they know that. Um, so there was space for negotiating more for more, but I'm pretty pessimistic about that prospect because again, as I said, it has taken us uh, such a long time to restore a deal that we already had and we haven't been successful. So I, I think it's unrealistic to get a more for more option. The other option is less for less, that basically they would freeze their nuclear program and we would only give them partial sanctions relief. Uh, and even that, I'm uh, cynical about it because it was uh, proposed to Iran twice last year and Iran didn't accept it. Uh, and finding the commensurate quid pro quo for a less for less, given the fact that we don't have direct negotiations and uh, there's so much mismatch expectations, I also think is unlikely. Um, so then we are left with um, the option of a single measure deal that Barbara referred to, which I think is more realistic. And it also probably would fall short of the threshold of the Iran Nuclear Agreement Review Act that Congress passed in 2015, because it will be considered a voluntary measure and not necessarily a new deal. It might not require congressional review, which of course reduces the political cost of it for the Biden administration and therefore make it more likely and it's easier to negotiate. Uh, but still, it's not going to be easy. Uh, it's easier, but not easy. Um, and finally, there is the possibility of a humanitarian deal. Uh, we have four American citizens uh, taken hostage in Iran. Uh, Iranians want uh, access to their frozen assets in South Korea, which is about seven, $8 billion uh, that they would be able to use for humanitarian trade. Uh, and so there is a there is a space for that kind of agreement, which of course would not resolve the nuclear issue, but of course would create a, uh, a you know a better atmosphere for uh, the nuclear negotiations. Other than that, if all of that proves impossible, I think both sides should at least agree not to cross each other's red lines by and recognize where 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 these red lines lie. I think that's the only way that we can buy time and and uh, avoid the worst. Some commentators, and this is a question to both of you too, uh, some commentators have mentioned that uh, uh, at, at some point, and we may be very close to it, that the uh, there's little incentive less to even go back into the deal because uh, uh, the, the, the nuclear uh, mark is almost there and uh, th there's little left to uh, negotiate with. Look, I think it's still worth it if we can get the Iranians to roll back what they've done. I mean, you have to, you know, what are the Iranians after with this program? Do they want a bomb? Okay, if that's what they really want, then there isn't much we can can do. But, you know, they've been slow rolling this program for so many years. They've never developed a weapon, even though they've had a nuclear program since the late 1950s. So if they see it more as leverage, uh, then they're still going to try to bargain it away, I would assume. And I think it's worth it's worth the effort. Uh, it would be incredibly destabilizing for Iran to become a nuclear weapon state. Uh, it would cause a nuclear arms race in the region. We would see uh, the Saudis for sure go after them. And uh, Israel, of course, would be uh, ramping up all of its covert activities in various ways, which could be also very destabilizing. So I think it's still worth a try. The question is whether the Iranians still think it's worth it. Now, there was a mention earlier of the uh, Shanghai Cooperation Organization. You know, Iran is relying on China and Russia uh, uh, more and more. Uh, but I think that most Iranians will tell you that they still want options. They don't want to have to rely on China and Russia. They want to be able to restore at least some economic links with, with the Europeans and with other countries. So, you know, I think there's, there's still something to talk about. Well, there's a report that they're attending the Semicon Cooperation Organization. That's meeting. the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. We, they, have, 
they're going to be full members full members probably by next year but as i i was uh explaining to someone this is not a nato this is not an eu this is a bunch of countries russia china and a bunch of of uh, central asian states that don't agree on very much uh, the trade links that Iran has with countries like Turkmenistan, you know, I mean, they're not, they're not that important, not compared to the oil that they could sell to, uh, to Germany or France or, or Greece or Spain or Italy. So, you know, it's something the Iranians can put forward to say, look at us, we're not isolated, uh, but it's no substitute for getting sanctions relief. So the, the, uh, single, the single initiative uh, proposal to to allow them to start exporting oil to, that would also benefit Europe certainly in the current gas uh, gas crisis that uh, comes from the Ukraine war and the Russian cutoffs of the pipes is that is that seen in uh, in Washington as a possible single um, effort to uh, make yeah. one step towards um, uh, the deal here. I don't know, frankly. I haven't asked uh, Rob Malley or Envoy whether they're considering fallback positions. My impression is that the administration still thinks it's possible to get a full revival of the original JCPOA, uh, which obviously would be better for Iran. It would have far less limitations on its economy and obviously would be better for every everyone who wants to see Iran's nuclear program rolled back. So I don't think they've given up. I think the question is now timing. Is there time to do something before the U.S. midterms under the legislation that was passed by Congress? Congress gets 30 days to review uh, any new nuclear agreement with Iran. So is there even time to do that before our midterms? And is that a debate that that people in Congress want to have? Uh, you know, I think I think that any deal would survive in this Congress easily because you would need a two thirds majority in both houses to block it. But I'm not sure it's a debate that even supporters of the deal want to necessarily have before the midterms. So the question is if we don't have anything before the midterms, is there something we can do uh, between now and November that would help stabilize the situation and uh, calm people down? And as I say, I don't know whether the administration has gone there. Ali mentioned that there was discussion about interim agreements last year, and the Iranians didn't didn't take that up at the mm. time. Amar, you uh, can you uh, deal with the uh, raised hands and uh, uh, and ask your question and unmute those who have raised hands, please. Yeah, sure. can, I, can I add something on the single uh, measure deal? Yeah, please, Ali, please do. Yeah, sure. Uh, so look, uh, for instance, let's take this uh, idea of Iranian oil uh, uh, sales to Europe, which, as Barbara said, the Europeans uh, are in desperate need of it, and Iran has plenty of it ready uh, for exports. Uh, so seemingly it's win-win, right? But what single measure on the Iranian side would be worth uh, so much additional uh, oil revenue for Iran? Uh, that's and it becomes extremely difficult uh, to find a, a deal that is mutually acceptable um, because uh, I'm sure uh, there will be so much criticism in Congress already. Uh, even some of the proponents of the agreement are uncomfortable with the fact that because of Iran's irreversible nuclear advancements, uh, especially uh, with regards to advanced centrifuges, the breakout time, if the deal is restored, is not going to be the original uh, 12 months, it's going to now be six months. Um, and, you know, if you get a deal in which Iran is selling oil um, at, while it's still enriching to high levels, it's going to be very problematic, right? I mean, it's a hard sell in Washington, even if you get uh, transparency measures uh, in return. Um, if you, uh, you know, uh, freeze the... Um, uh, enrichment uh, at higher levels, but don't get the transparency measures, then you're still going to be crucified in Washington. And that's why this is just so difficult uh, to resolve, even if we're talking about a single measure. Although, again, as I said, I think it has a better chance um, compared to other alternatives. But still, in my view, the best and the low cost option for both sides is the restoration of the JCPOA itself. 
great. Thanks, Ali. Um, so, Tom, do you want to go to questions? Should I yes, to let's, let's uh, yeah, they're raised hands uh, uh, that you can recognize. Yeah, okay, sure. All right, so I'll read off. Um, okay, first, I have a question. I have a question, because, Barbara, you mentioned how Iran was uh, uh, getting into closer relationships with Russia and China, but they, they still want access to uh, Western markets as well. But, but at, at what point would Iran have to say, we can't uh, deal with the West, we can't trust them. They pulled out of the Iran nuclear deal, they uh, freeze our assets. Like, isn't US policy just driving a country like Iran closer to countries like Russia and China? Well, I think it has, but the fact is that Iran still has a fair amount of trade with Europe there, uh, you know, consumer goods, pharmaceuticals, things like that. Uh, and, you know, Iran, Iranian business people have historically had very strong ties to, to, to Europe and to European companies. Uh, the Iranian diaspora does not live in Russia and China. The Iranian diaspora lives in the West. It lives in Europe and the United States and Australia and Canada and so on. Uh, so there are a lot of ties that have been built up over, over the years. And um, I, I don't think that Russia and China are a real substitute uh, for, for Iran. Um, I mean, if they have to rely on them, they will, uh, but it, it, I, I still think there would be an interest in, in getting back into better relationships with, in particular with the Europeans and also with the South Koreans, the Japanese uh, and others, um, India even. I mean, there are a lot of countries that Iran cannot trade with very effectively because of US secondary sanctions which inhibit uh, large companies in all of these countries from doing business with Iran. Um, so that's still, I think, our, our, our leverage. I think The Economist has reported, it's not surprising that Russia doesn't have much to sell that Iran wants to buy. Um, <laughs> Russia's selling, buying from Iran, it's they're, buying they're, drones yeah, from Iran. Yeah, 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 that's true. But in terms of other products that Russia has to sell, it's oil and gas, which Iran doesn't need to buy from Russia. Um, so they were they estimated at most if it were pushed, the Iran Russia trade might go up by ten or fifteen percent at the very most. So it's not a replacement trade um, arrangement for what's been cut off from the West. Okay, so I'll that is absolutely right. And and let me also add that uh, right now Iran and Russia are competing with one another. Uh, to sell oil to China, and th therefore they both have to give China bigger discounts. Okay. All right, so I'll read off uh, two questions from uh, Professor Val Mogadon, and then we'll take a question from Kim. So uh, Val is saying, uh, thank you for the two sobering presentations. Two questions. One, isn't Biden simply continuing the Trump stance, also Israel's stance? And uh, how, how can the US administration scold the Rossi regime on human rights when it is on excellent terms with uh, MB, the MBS regime? And uh, secondly, is it not the case that US has imposed third party sanctions? I don't know about third party, they're, they're secondary, secondary sanctions. Look, um, you know, I don't know. I don't think Biden is Trump. Biden is trying to get back into the deal. He appointed Rob Malley, who was one of the original negotiators of the JCPOA, to lead this effort. And, and I can tell you that the American negotiators are working very hard and very assiduously to get this deal back. Uh, Trump quit the deal, said he could negotiate something better, and of course was able to negotiate nothing. <laughs> And, and everything, of course, got, got much worse as a result, including regional tensions. So no, I don't, I don't equate the two. I think they're, they're, they're quite different. Um, in terms of the human rights, yes, you're absolutely right. Our policy is totally hypocritical. I mean, we, are, we just gave some more military aid to Egypt, which I think has more political <laughs> prisoners than, than any other country in the world right now, uh, probably on a level, at least with Turkey, many more than Iran does. Um, but, you know, uh, and, and MBS, we won't even, I mean, the, the man is unspeakable in, 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 in the crimes that he's committed. Uh, but these, uh, these countries have, uh, you know, they're not calling for uh, the destruction of Israel like Iran is. Uh, and they're not supporting groups which are attacking 
uh, our friends and partners in the region, like Iran is. Uh, so it's, it's, you know, Iran gets harsher treatment because of its rhetoric and because of its actions. And uh, it doesn't change that rhetoric and it doesn't change those actions in, in a way that would, would merit, you know, uh, softer treatment from the United States. Um, I think one of the things that's at the root of all these problems is the fact that Iran still refuses to recognize Israel's right to exist more than 70 years after this country was recognized by the United Nations. So it's understandable that this causes a lot of opposition and consternation in the United States. And Iran, as Tom mentioned, and Ali continue to take American hostages uh, after all these years. Uh, so, uh, you know, nobody is going to cut this country a break uh, without some change in the way it, 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 uh, it, it uh, interacts with the United States and the international community. That's just a fact. Do you think in, in, in the what you know of the negotiations, the, the final deal hasn't been revealed, um, that there's any indication that they might be ready to begin to uh, ease up on some of the, the behaviors that, uh, no. <laughs> that, we, that we object to? Well, I think we would get our we would get our, our hostages back. Uh, but there is no I mean, this is a nuclear agreement. And it is not going to deal with Iran's support for various uh, militias. It's not going to deal with Iran's ballistic missile program, its drone program. I mean, the hope was always that if we could get the JCPOA and, and implement it properly, then we could talk about other things with Iran. I think it would make it easier for Iran to reach agreements of various sorts with its Arab neighbors uh, on some of these issues, which would be helpful. Uh, but first things first, we have to get the nuclear deal back first, I think. There are, there's a separate track on the hostage is issue. And my understanding, our understanding is that those Americans would be freed at the same time that this nuclear agreement would be revived. Uh, that, you know, the Iranians are, understand that that's very important to the United States. Other questions? Okay, we have a question for Kim. Um, Kim, are you able to unmute? I would like to have you address uh, two things that make Iran less of a threat. One is they do not have the capability to actually make a nuclear weapon. It's the, it would take a lot longer to actually make the weapon. I was just reading an article earlier today that reinforced that. Plus, um, there was the religious leader. Uh, uh, I, his name is not in my mind right now. Has has issued an a fatwa, a religious decree, to not have nuclear weapons. So, and that's not been brought up in this conversation. So, um, I it makes me less worried, I guess. Uh, and and then there's the third point is the hypocrisy of the United States who has the second uh, amount of nuclear weapons in the whole world. The only countries ever used them, not only once, but twice on civilians. How, it's like, how dare we <laughs> try yeah. to prevent anybody from having that power? If uh, I mean, just, just on hypocrisy alone. Hmm. Well, uh, unfortunately, I mean, yes, it would take Iran uh, another year or so to actually make a weapon, uh, but Iran knows how to make bombs. I think the concern is that if this crisis continues, that uh, at some point the JCPOA will completely collapse. Uh, and uh, if Iran is referred back to the UN Security Council, that uh, Iran would quit the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty uh, and, as North Korea did back in 2003 and go forward with making nuclear weapons. As far as this fatwa is concerned, I mean, you know, yes, no, I, it's, it's, I, it's never been, been written down anywhere. It's just something that Ayatollah Khamenei said. Uh, he may, he may no, not be with us much longer, in which case the fatwa would expire with him. Uh, so, no, I'm not convinced Iran would actually make nuclear weapons. I don't think it would actually serve its national interest to do so, because, as I mentioned, 
it would set off a, 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 a nuclear arms race in, in the region that Iran frankly could not win. Uh, but, uh, but there are people in Iran, influential people who are talking about it and talking about it much more openly than they ever did before saying we've paid this huge economic price already, we may as well have the weapon, which would deter the Israelis, for example, from, from continuing to assassinate our, our nuclear scientists and sabotaging our, our programs. So I'm not confident that they wouldn't go all the way uh, to nuclear weapons. Uh, and hypocrisy, you know, it's, it's, it's not new. Uh, the United States as a, as a major power has gotten away with murder, literally. Uh, has broken international law repeatedly, invading countries when we had no authorization, uh, and then we complain when Iran supports militia groups in, in neighboring states. So if you're looking for morality in, in foreign policy, you know, you, you need to look elsewhere. It's, it's not the world we live in. I may also add on the fatwa. Um, look, the reality is that because uh, there is no trust in Iran's intentions, and not just by the United States, by the way. I mean, this is a deal that was negotiated by the Europeans, by even Russia and China. Uh, they all wanted these firm commitments by Iran and transparency measures, restrictions on its uh, enrichment uh, capacity. Uh, because there is no trust in intentions, you limit uh, the capability until trust is restored. That was the whole point of the JCPOA uh, and its restoration would also achieve the same objective. There is simply no way. I mean, if you say uh, any country can uh, go and develop uh, nuclear weapons because uh, we in the past have uh, done so and have used it and there are other nuclear weapons states and the entire non-proliferation regime will, will collapse and, and it would make for a world that is going to be much less safe than, uh, than even the, the turmoil that we're currently dealing with. Okay, great. There are comments, I think, in the afternoon session and, and elsewhere too, uh, that uh, I would ask Barbara, uh, that Europeans have essentially been ineffective in this entire period since, uh, since Trump uh, abandoned the deal in 2018. Um, is there is is it your sense that they have been effective at least in the the progress we've made until August eighth? Have they been the essential link in all of this, really? And if so, what's what's keeping us? What's keeping them from uh, uh, proceeding beyond what we've got gotten to so far? Yeah. They did their job. I mean, back in March, they had a draft agreement. And in fact, the European negotiators, a lot of them went home, they left Vienna and said, well, we finished our work. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and there've been refinements since then. There was another draft uh, on August the 8th, uh, but they've done their job. And, and the, you know, Enrique Mora of the European Union, Josep Borrell of the European Union have been in charge of this process. And, and you know, I have not read the text of the agreement, others have but they say it's a perfectly reasonable basis for coming back into compliance. The problem has been that Iran has raised various other issues that are outside the purview of the JCPOA. And sometimes it drops them and then it raises them up again. For example, this issue of uh, the IAEA investigation into the undeclared uh, sites where these traces of uranium were found. Iran seemed to have dropped that demand and then they raised it again just a week ago. You know, so people, Europeans are tearing their hair out. Rob Malley is tearing what little hair he has left out because uh, Iran is playing games uh, with the negotiations. So either they haven't reached an, a domestic internal consensus to go back in, or they still think somehow they're gonna squeeze more concessions out of the United States. But uh, I don't think that's gonna happen. So maybe when they finally realize that, they will come around to taking the deal that's been on the table basically since March. Okay. There's also been a fair amount of conversation um, the, among those who are sort of laying out um, uh, what you might call, what, what are the alternatives uh, to the JCPOA? And uh, when you go through those, uh, they're really, I think the conclusion that everyone I've heard reaches um, is that there is there really is no alternative um, there is no other avenue 
that is not a military um, or economic uh, warfare solution uh, that will get us nowhere. Uh, and I don't know, is that something that's really being contemplated at this point, or do we have to wait until uh, after the midterms um, to see if, if there's some real meat to the, the uh, intent to sign after the, after the elections? Ali, I don't know if you want to say something. Sure. Um, look, Tom, uh, reality is, you know, at some point before the JCPOA uh, was finalized, uh, there was a debate in Washington about uh, pros and cons of, uh, of, of signing a nuclear deal with Iran. And obviously, opponents of the agreement were in favor of more pressure and, uh, and even, uh, you know, taking military action. But, you know, we now have a case which is quite unique in uh, international relations, which is that we have actually lived these two different alternatives, the world with the deal and the world without the deal. Uh, the reality is that the only thing that has slowed down and curbed Iran's nuclear program in the past 20 years that we've been in this nuclear crisis with Iran has been the nuclear deal. Um, everything else that we have done from sabotage to covert operations, assassinations, sanctions, threat of use of military force. I mean, for God's sake, at some point we had 150,000 troops on both sides of Iran in Afghanistan and Iraq. What else do you want as, as uh, true, um, uh, you know, concrete, uh, believable military threat than that? But none of that slowed Iran. The only thing that slowed and curbed the program was the nuclear deal. Um, and, you know, the, the promise of maximum pressure under the Trump administration was that they would uh, basically uh, um, deprive Iran of its uh, resources to advance its regional policy, force it to come back to the table and negotiate a better nuclear deal. In practice, what maximum pressure did was that it has brought Iran to the verge of nuclear weapons. Uh, it rendered Iran much more aggressive in the region and much more repressive at home. Um, and so I, I think the answer to the question of what are the alternatives, we know more pressure uh, will produce uh, an even bigger nuclear program in Iran. And even the military option, even U.S. assessments, uh, is that uh, a military option would only set back Iran's nuclear program uh, from six to uh, uh, 18 months. Uh, not more than that. And so then we have to do it again and again and again, which is what the Israelis refer to as mowing the grass. Uh, and, mm -hmm. and that would be uh, a real disaster. Uh, and of course, the Iranians would not sit on their hands and they would retaliate. They would not only target U.S. Uh, bases in the region, but they would also use their network of partners and proxies in the region to attack interests of U.S. and U.S. allies in the region. There are hundreds of thousands of uh, Hezbollah missiles targeting Israeli civilian population uh, populations. And we also saw uh, in 2019 uh, that Iran uh, backed an attack on Saudi oil infrastructure that took half of Saudi's oil off the market overnight. Uh, and so there is serious risk that even a limited military interaction between Iran and the U.S. would turn into a regional conflagration. Uh, so, yeah, there is no... Uh, alternative other than finding a diplomatic settlement. Uh, and that's why I'm hoping that even if the JCPOA proves to be, uh, you know, uh, beyond their reach post-November, uh, that at least they would find one of the other diplomatic arrangements that uh, we discussed on this call. I think, uh, uh, can you unmute Carolyn? I think she's been waiting to um, ask a question. Am I already unmuted? Yes. Good. My question relates to this question of the uh, trace, traces of uranium that the IAEA has been, been raising up as an issue. I would like to put that together with the, the question of the fatwa and also whether Iran was actually engaged in a nuclear program post-2003 because my hypothesis is Iran had a nuclear program when they were afraid of being attacked nuclearly by Saddam Hussein, who was wiped out in 2003, at which point 
the Iran decided that they didn't need to have a nuclear weapons program anymore because Hussein was gone, very thoroughly gone. And so then they could address their religious needs, which is not to fight a war with fire. And I'll also point out that the United States has been in violation of the Non-Proliferation Treaty all around. As a person who spends a fair amount of time at the Livermore Nuclear Weapons Lab, I'll say that a lot of those researchers are not happy with it, but they are looking at the long range, long range, what the hell does it say? Long range standoff missile, which is designed to take off from God knows where 3,000 miles away and Bob, God knows whoever they would feel let's, felt like. Let's let, uh, since we're running out of time, we are out of time, maybe just very, get one very quick quickly, yeah. Yeah, no, you're, you're right. There are two reasons that, excuse me, <clears throat> that Iran uh, abandoned the program. Excuse me. One was uh, that they were caught in 2002 with uh, facilities they had not declared. And the, and the second was, you're right, the motivation was gone with Saddam. Um, and you're also right that the United States has not fulfilled its obligations. <coughs> Excuse me. Let me help you out, Barbara. <coughs> Sorry. Yeah, but Thank saying, you. Uh, but just saying that uh, uh, you're absolutely right. The <coughs> motivation, I think, was uh, Saddam's uh, nuclear weapon program, which we believe he had. Uh, obviously, Iran also believed that he had. And he had used chemical weapons against Iran. Uh, during the Iran-Iraq war. So there was uh, no doubt that if he had other <laughs> weapons of mass destruction, he might uh, use them against the Iranians as well. But I think the mistake that the Iranians committed is that once it was revealed that they had a secret nuclear program, they denied that they ever sought nuclear weapons. Mm -hmm. uh, if they had at that point used the exact arguments that you used, uh, and would say, well, you know, uh, we were afraid of Saddam, but now we've abandoned uh, that nuclear weapons program. Uh, they would not have been in this situation 20 years later, uh, that there's still, uh, you know, information and intelligence coming out about their past nuclear activities. Uh, and it is still in their interest to come, come clean once and for all, uh, expecting to use their nuclear leverage uh, to uh, force the international community to forget about uh, the fact that they had this nuclear weapons program is a strategy that has failed them in the past and I think will fail them in the future. I think we've, we've, uh, we've hit the eight o'clock mark. Um, I hope Barbara recovers from her- <laughs> Too her, much uh, talking to- <laughs> uh, With whatever good cough drops you can find. I thank you both for uh, a, a really terrific um, guidance through the, the things that many of us don't have access to uh, and appreciate your verification of many things that we only get little bits and pieces from out of the media. Um, given the silence since August 8th, we're needless to say on the edge of our seats to find out what the texts are and what how far away from actually getting to something after November 8th we might actually be. Um, and I think we're still kind of stuck on the edges of our seats um, in, in that regard. So thank you all very, very much uh, for your participation and for making this a, a terrific hour. Um, I would remind you that th those of you who would like to stay on and get any guidance as to how to connect with your representatives, I think part of our mission here was and will continue to be particularly if this, um, if this agreement really gets to the point where we get it to the Hill and, and initiate the INARA process, which requires a vote um, and it can be overridden by veto um, by the president. But uh, there is some likelihood, according to some, some analysts, that that process does have the potential to go forward um, now, maybe more than it has any time in the last um, years since 2018. So I think it, it's, it's incumbent upon all of us to not just listen to and have these discussions among ourselves, uh, which after all these years ends up being, if not an echo chamber, at least agreement among those of us who um, are not opposed to uh, peace and diplomacy, um, and that we must continue to do that. But we have to make it our voices heard to those on the Hill 
of, of whom there are still many who practice uh, what I call it is iranophobia um, and don't listen to rational or, or reasonable arguments, but simply have a preconditioned view of that anything coming from Iran must, must be opposed. So please, all of you who are so inclined, uh, please use the resource we provided. Um, if you want to reach out to your reps and senators um, after this, um, reach out to MAPA. And uh, there's a really wonderful app that we have uh, that connects you very easily with one or two clicks to the folks that you should be talking to. Thank you. Thanks, I'm gonna say my goodbyes. Thanks for inviting us, appreciate it. Thanks, Ali, thanks, Barbara. Take care. Bye-bye. So to, to those who've hung on, uh, I, I guess all I can say in, in uh, closing is uh, if you haven't already, uh, clicked on the link to your reps and senators, please do. Um, I think uh, we, those of us who've been through uh, various training programs uh, about what happens and what responses uh, you get from the folks on the Hill is that they really do count and they really do, um, even if it's just two words, they look at you know what the, what the mood of the country is. All the polls that have come out any time in the last six months that I've seen have very uh, encouraging numbers in terms of the percentage of Americans who support the JCPOA and support diplomacy as opposed to uh, aggression and military action. And it's, in it, it's I think, consistently been over 70%. Um, I think we're all uh, sick and tired of the Afghanistan and Iraq, and you, know, you could even reach back to Vietnam. Uh, uh, wars that made no sense and uh, had no actual purpose uh, from any kind of point of view. So I would say uh, it's very encouraging, but the, the gap between the citizens who are, are saying is over 70% are in favor of diplomacy and those on the Hill uh, who, who don't have that high uh, a percentage of favorability uh, opinion is something we have to overcome. May I offer uh, something about Vietnam? The Ecumenical Peace Institute website contains a link to a recent poetry reading, which is a benefit for Haiti Emergency Relief Fund, which included a poem called Wasted, which is my poem. And it is about the Vietnam War. And I will recommend going to the epicalc.org and get it go down in the line to the recording of the of the poetry reading, which was just a few weeks ago. And it does have that one particular poem in it. Thank you for that information. I think uh, if I think we're done, um, I know I'm ready to sign off. Uh, if if there's no one who needs any further information about linking up or making calls, um, uh, do so on the MAPA website. Does anybody know what the group that's talking about peace building department are talking about? I'm not sure what you're referring to. Well, somebody who seems to be involved in it, including Veterans for Peace, are proposing the construction of a Department of Peace Building. I'm not quite sure what a department would do, though. Well, uh, I'm not sure either. It's a, it's a, a speculation for another night. Um, I think I have to leave and... Uh, I appreciate everyone who's uh, who's still um, uh, joined us and uh, have a good night. Um, thank uh, you for putting on this wonderful thank you. We program. Appreciate it. Beautiful, really beautiful, beautiful, beautiful.